We will get this rolling. Good to go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Become a Cybersecurity Ninja, our 10-part web webinar series. Today is session five, On the Move, Mobile Security and While Traveling. And at the end of the session, as I was telling folks, we will be halfway through. Those of you who have been with us for every session, God bless you. It's awesome. And hopefully you feel like you're getting uh, good information here and we're uh, getting this stuff out there. So we've covered threat modeling and risk assessment. We've covered network security basics, firewalls, VPN, vulnerability scanning. We're going to be talking about VPNs again today, but in a different context. We've talked about authentication, passwords, password managers, two-factor authentication. We talked about encryption, and that's going to come up again today. And today is on the move, mobile security and while traveling. And then in two weeks, we'll have don't feed the fish. Phishing, Social Engineering, and Ransomware, which we expect to be a, a very popular session. I, of course, am Joshua Pesquet. With me is Ben Gardner, also from Roundtable. And Roundtable is a team of dedicated technology professionals operating out of Maine, New York, and we work with hundreds of organizations to help them achieve their missions through effective use of technology. Our learning objectives today, we're going to talk about risks around mobile use. We're going to talk about protecting some ways to protect yourself. We're going to talk about using public Wi-Fi and some practices when you're doing that related to that, encryption and VPN. We're going to talk about mobile device management. This is probably something that's aimed more for larger organizations, but uh, some people actually have access to mobile management tools already, and I'll, I'll walk through those just a little bit. We'll, of course, have our usual checklist of best practices and resources for further learning. Without further ado, let's throw out our first poll. So I'm curious as to what people are protecting their smartphones with currently, and just kind of if there's anyone out there that doesn't even use a password yet. So I'm curious as to how many people out there are using four-digit passcodes, how many people are using six-digit passcodes? How many people are using pattern lock? Pattern lock. Whether people are using uh, Touch ID, and how many people maybe don't want to uh, respond here? We'll leave this open just for a little bit, so we'll see what answers we get. Let's go ahead and close that and take a look at the responses then. All right, so most people are using passwords, but we do have a few, a uh, little under 10% that are maybe not using a password on your smartphone yet. And all I have to say for those of you who do not currently have a password on your smartphone is please, please, please go ahead and, and put a password on there. Ben, let's go ahead and close that up. And off we go. <clears throat> Risks with mobile technology, this little cartoon actually kind of covers one of, I think, the big risks that a lot of us think about, which is that I go into a coffee shop, I go into a hotel, I go into an airport, I go maybe even to a friend's house or to a neighboring organization and get onto a Wi-Fi network that I don't control or manage or have, have uh, confidence is secure, what's going to happen to my information? And so this little cartoon, I think, summarizes that very well. And uh, just as a quick aside, I actually walked, was, was working from a coffee shop in my neighborhood last week. I actually had gone there for some cybersecurity uh, work that I was doing on a couple of projects that I'm working on. And sitting there was someone who had a network scanning tool that I recognized. Uh, ben, it was uh, an Enable uh, product and was running some something. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to stand too close, uh, sort of stand over their shoulder, but I, I was like, interesting, someone sitting in a, this cafe running a network scanning tool, and uh, quickly ran through my own checklist for myself and kind of was thinking, is there anything I'm doing this person's going to be able to, to get access to while I was, you know, there. And just uh, as for, for folks who want to know what I do, I actually, wherever possible, and we'll get to this later, I don't use public Wi-Fi networks. I have an unlimited mobile plan. Uh, and I try to use that wherever I possibly can and only use public Wi-Fi networks if I can't get my mobile to work because there's no signal there. But we'll cover that later. What are some of the risks that we kind of commonly think of around mobile security? And, and if anybody thinks I'm missing something here, this is a great place to you know, throw your ideas into the chat. But obviously, we're worried about our devices, our laptops, our phones, our tablets being stolen. We're worried about losing them, just leaving them in the cab, leaving them in the restaurant. We're worried, as that cartoon demonstrated, about being on insecure networks where our information can be compromised or our passwords can be compromised. 
Uh, BYOD, for those of you who may not know that, that's bring your own device. And I think this is probably one of the biggest challenge areas for organizations is how almost every organization allows their staff to access things like email and documents and Salesforce applications and other things from their personal mobile devices, from their home computers, from their laptops, from their smartphones and tablets. But those are devices over which there typically is no corporate control. They're not things that are part of the corporate environment and aren't managed in that way. And there are then concerns about are those devices or the networks on which those devices are running, or both, insecure. And so, you know, me in my home, we can, you know, as a cybersecurity professional, I can hopefully have a secure home network. But what about all of the other 22 people that work for Roundtable? Am I confident that they all have secure home networks where they're doing a lot of their work from? Am I confident that they're all engaged in best practices with their personal mobile devices? Well, that's that's a real challenge for Roundtable and for, for really any organization. And insecure practices, people writing passwords on post-it notes and leaving them on their monitors is like a classic one. People emailing sensitive information and in plain text, emailing passwords in plain text, emailing passwords generally, uh, you know, going on to insecure networks and conducting sensitive transactions, doing banking transactions, uh, you know, other kinds of things. So insecure practices in general, and I could go on. And a concern that I would say no one really thought about very much until the last month or so, which is crossing international borders, and in particular, I would say, returning to the U.S. from abroad and wondering about what uh, privacy implications there might be uh, in terms of doing that. And I will touch on that a little bit today. Okay. Things experienced ninjas have learned already. So things that folks who have attended these sessions already know and that apply here. Number one, using password managers. If you have strong passwords, you're not reusing passwords. Your passwords are 30-digit, complex, alphanumeric things that, that are not, you know, plain English words that are going to be easy to guess. Those, that, that helps. Using two-factor authentication, 2FA, helps a ton in terms of if your password is compromised. It's a lot less of a problem if you're using two-factor authentication. They encrypt their devices. They encrypt sensitive communications, and they keep an eye on their stuff, so you don't walk away from your computer or your smartphone, even for a moment, while at a cafe or, or in a public place. All right. Uh, ben is just raising that there's a question. Let's see here. Sorry about that. I, I missed that there's a question. Ah, there, this is a great question in here. I am going to cover that, but I will cover that later. It's a question about uh, hotspots and things. I'll cover that when I get to Wi-Fi networks. Thank you for raising that, Ben. Sorry, I didn't have that open. New for today. So we'll be talking about those handy public Wi-Fi networks. We'll be talking about what to do if your phone is lost. We'll be talking about virtual private networking. That's where we'll spend a fair amount of our time. And mobile device management, what, what mobile device management does, how it can apply to your organization. Those are probably the two most complex. We'll get through those first two relatively quickly. Last week, we had a quote about encryption. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the person it was, but about uh, the importance of encryption to a free society and, and how strong encryption is, is kind of one of the cornerstones to having a free society. And Edward Snowden, I'm assuming most people are familiar with, and this, this was really relevant in the news that, that came out two weeks ago. I think it was literally during the webinar or around about, but uh, there was a WikiLeaks of, of a lot of NSA hacking tools essentially that and vulnerabilities that they'd be able to take advantage of and one of the things that was widely misunderstood in that report uh, I saw a lot of news reports basically saying that the encrypted application signal had been you know that, that the NSA had a compromise for that or, or discovered a vulnerability in that, that they were able to exploit and that was absolutely just to be clear not true but to Edward Snowden's point here, because they had there were so many vulnerabilities in endpoints, which are your laptops, your computers, your phones, and your tablets, if your phone, let's say, is completely exploited and someone has remote control of it, remote access to everything that's happening on the screen and can record that, then of course whatever, in, in, or maybe not of course, it may not be obvious to everybody, but whatever encryption you're using isn't going to help you if someone can actually see literally what's on your screen because you need to decrypt that information in order to view it, and as soon as you decrypt it, 
then whoever has control of your device and is seeing what's on your screen has now seen the decrypted message as well. And so the exploits that the NSA had did not in any way um, reveal vulnerabilities in signal. They were not breaking the signal encryption. Uh, it was simply that they, if your device that you were using signal on was, was owned, so to speak, or pwned, if you want to use the, the cyber term, then it doesn't matter that you're using Signal. Hopefully that, that makes sense to everybody. And the main point to make here is endpoint security or the security of these different devices that you're using and the networks that they're on. That's where all of the weaknesses are. Encryption by itself, which we talked about last week, is actually quite strong, especially if you implement it well. Let's ask this question. Does anyone here in this webinar regularly use a virtual private network or a VPN when you're working from home or from public locations. We can add in while traveling. Curious as to what folks' response are here. Do you regularly use a VPN or virtual private network when working from home or from public locations? We'll leave that open just for a few more seconds and let's go ahead and take a look at the response. And we've got pretty overwhelming. This is, I wasn't totally sure what to expect here. This is pretty in line. Most people are not using a virtual private network. And before we turned on the, the microphones, you can go ahead and close that up, Ben. Ben and I were, were talking about you know, traveling internationally. Ben, I, I don't know if you want to repeat what you said. I, I thought you said it very well <laughs> about VPN, do you remember? Are you there? Uh, five minutes. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. I don't remember specifically. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. You were basically saying that a VPN was like as fundamental to like as a travel oh, tool yes. as at this point it's like your charger and your, your Yeah, I would say that um, a VPN at least at least for your your mobile device, your smartphone or or you know, in most cases for a laptop as well is is really as vital and as fundamental as your passport or a visa when you're doing international travel um, because you know, as as uh, prevalent as, say, in Josh's example, someone sitting in a cafe scanning your phone or your computer is in the United States, it may be more depending on where you're going. Um, so it's it's very fundamental and it's, uh, it's not really, um, it, you're really not doing yourself any favor if you're not signing up for VPN. Most VPNs are pretty cheap, 10 to $20 per month, and you can select where your computer or your smartphone connects to, and it's they're, they're specifically designed to be very easy to use. So you're, you're really, uh, it's almost a, a required item at this point uh, for all uh, digital devices when you go out of the country, definitely. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Sorry I put you on the spot there, but thank you. That was perfect. That was awesome. All right. Virtual private networks. We're going to walk quickly through how they work. Uh, cornerstone is that you, it, it allows you to browse the internet privately. You're securing your data. You're, you're hiding your device, so to speak, from the network you're on. And there's a few different ways to explain it. One is that whatever network you're using, if it's, let's say, I just, I always like to use the Starbucks. You're just using the Starbucks down the street. If you connect to Starbucks Wi-Fi, because it's nice and fast and it's convenient and doesn't cost you anything, and then boot up your VPN, you've created your nice own little private network. And that's actually where the term comes from, right? It's not actually a private network. You're actually on the Starbucks network, but you've created a virtual private network for yourself. And that's where what literally what VPN means. And so virtually, you're on your own network that you're using. And that's really, really handy for security. Quick note, uh, actual bears are really involved in, in VPN. I just want to make that very clear in case anyone's confused. Sometimes people say clouds are actually part of cloud computing, so bears are not actually part of VPN. Using a VPN. In the next few slides, I'm going to sh just show quickly how you would do this. I'm not going to do a live screen share. I'm just going to, but I will, I will give you some screenshots. I'm going to show a product called Hide. VPN, and for only one reason, and it, I want to be really clear, it has nothing to do with its reputation. I do not endorse Hyde VPN. In fact, Ben and I will, will give you some, some VPNs that we do like. Hyde is, isn't necessarily one of them. I don't dislike it. It's not one I particularly recommend. But they use Ninja in their branding. So really, what choice did I have, given that we're doing this type of security Ninja series? You can trial any of these. They're pretty easy. And the way it works is once you have your VPN service, you know, connected. You you sign up for it the same way you would sign up for anything else. You give it an email address, which functions as your username. You give it a password, 
a lot of the services will create a username and a password for the VPN that is different from your email address for privacy reasons, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and if privacy is important, which for most of you it is, that, that's probably an important service. So it's a little bit, uh, I put in my username here because that's what people would see. But in most cases, it'll be a gobbledygook username and then a, a password, hopefully that's equally gobbledygook. And that'll be your username and password. And then you, you log in and you connect. And once you're connected, uh, you'll have some options as to, or once you're logged in, sorry, to your VPN service, then you would want to connect to the actual VPN. You have some few different options about what country you want to use. We'll get into that in a little bit. There's a, what's called an application killer or a network killer, where if the VPN becomes disconnected, it, it stops your network traffic. That can be important if you're using the VPN because you're doing sensitive transactions. You don't want if the VPN service goes down, now suddenly that transaction is going over that public Starbucks network. Um, these, this often goes by the term kill switch, meaning if the VPN connection drops, if you lose that connection, the VPN application will go ahead and kill your network, kill switch, until it reconnects again, which can be very helpful. Uh, and I'm sorry, once you're connected, I've missed a screenshot here, then you'll, you'll see usually in your system tray or in your toolbar, you'll have a little clock that just shows the time that you're connected. And that serves as a confirmation that you are connected to the VPN. As long as that clock is running, it'll show you how long you've been connected for. And as long as that continues to run, you are connected to that VPN, and that's, that's easy to traffic. Couple of things, uh, there are two broad types of virtual private networks that you might be able to take advantage of. If you have an option for the first one, the corporate, if that's provided to you by your organization, I would strongly recommend <clears throat> you take that choice um, with one caveat, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a moment. But um, that it would be provided by your company. It would still have a client-side application that you would run. So you would first connect to the public Starbucks Wi-Fi network and then immediately boot up your office's VPN client. It would connect to the VPN service and then you can begin browsing in that way. They will typically have a per seat license fee. It's usually connected to the, the firewall that your vendor, um, that your company uses. So if they use a Fortinet or a Sonic wall or something like that, those VPN clients usually are sold through that firewall or through that vendor. They will usually work for all platforms. You can use it on a Mac, you can use it on a PC, you can use it on uh, iOS, which is iPhone, you can use it on Android devices. And the privacy, and this is the one caveat, uh, if you use your company's VPN, then of course you're subject to whatever your company's privacy policies are. So your company may still be able to monitor, well not may, they definitely have the ability to monitor whatever you're doing over that VPN connection. Uh, whether or not they're doing that, of course, is, depends on what systems they have in place. But they certainly have the ability to monitor your uh, communications and your activities while you're connected on that VPN, just the same way as if you were in their office. You have virtually routed your computer's network connections through your corporate office. So it's like your computer is sitting in, in the office connected to a, a physical LAN cable or uh, the wireless network in the office. The private VPN services, Hide VPN is one of those, and, and in the resources section, I have a bunch of others listed. Ben, um, it, I know you might have to unmute for a second. What was the one that you, you said you were using one you liked quite a bit? Uh, I use a product called Nord VPN, like Nord, uh, is it like Norwegian? Uh, Nord VPN okay. is the name of the product, yep. And uh, Viper VPN uh, is another one I have in there, and we'll, we'll have links for, for all of these for you, so, so don't worry about that. This is something that you would just purchase yourself or, or you would have your company purchase for you. It will protect your individual privacy. So your account is yours and yours alone. Heads up, if you go start looking at any of these websites, they will seem a little shady. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, a lot of the client base for VPNs has historically been people who are doing things that are not super legal. So examples of things that aren't super bad but are still illegal are, you know, trying to have eight different people share one Netflix account. Uh, a VPN can be very helpful for that because you can pretend to be on lots of different networks even if you all live in the same apartment. Uh, another example of a VPN is maybe I'm, I want to stream 
uh, live sports and I live in the United States and I can't do that unless I'm a you know a subscriber to a particular cable provider so I can fake like I'm in uh, another country and now I'm allowed to watch this live stream because I'm not in the US that's something a VPN can do for you another thing it can do for you is if I want to illegally download uh, through torrent sites different kinds of movies and television shows then a VPN service can hide my IP address from authorities these are all things on the shady side and the VPN services you know market those very clearly so when you go to these you might feel a little bit dirty sort of playing the order but I, I want to encourage everybody that it is you know it is, there are plenty of legitimate legal reasons uh, Ben walked you through a few to be using VPN services and I want to encourage everyone not to be put off by those things the VPN services are an absolutely reasonable thing to be using Cost-wise, they will typically cost fifty to a hundred dollars a year. IP Vanish, Viper VPN, Nord VPN, which you don't have in there, uh, Express VPN is another one. Those are some of the the most popular services. I'm going to just take a minute because we do have a lot of questions in here. Okay, um, I'm just going to try to get through a couple in here. The prices you're quoting user per monthly. Uh, it the prices vary quite a bit, but I would say on average you could you could say at the high end of VPN is going to be $10 per month per person. That's about as high, it's about as expensive as any VPN service I've seen and then things can go down from there. Uh, another question in, using Google Apps has greatly decreased uh, my org's use of VPNs because so much of Google Apps for Business is encrypted in there. And, and that's great, except I would say that there's still a lot of things that people are doing outside of Google Apps and also, uh, the encryption within Google Apps protects you from things that are not Google, but Google, of course, can still be quite aware of all the things you're doing, and some people may may not be super delighted about that. So that's another uh, reason to want to. It, and again, there's there's differences. We haven't done the privacy versus security <laughs> version of this, but yeah. there there are two different things to kind of worry about, and and privacy is is very very different from a threat model perspective than security. And then a great question here uh, from Roberta, is a personal hotspot on an iPhone uh, as secure as a, as a MiFi device or something like that? Uh, so MiFi devices or you know, tethering to your phone, those are equivalent in terms of security. The big, the big you know, difference is the other people that are on the network with you. So if I can explain this as, as succinctly as I can, if I'm using my MiFi device and I'm the only one who's using that that device at the moment, then the only other people that are on that same network with me are me. I'm the only one. If, if, if Ben and I, you know, if Ben and I work in the same place and I pull out my MiFi device and I give Ben the password, now the only person I need to worry about, you know, cracking my stuff is Ben. And on the MiFi device, you can actually see how many people are connected. So, if, so it's very, very secure in that regard because if someone, you know, if you thought you were the only person there and you look on your MyFi and it says there's two people connected, you're like, huh, who's this other person? Probably it's your phone and your computer, <laughs> so they're both you, but you know, you still would could easily be aware of that. And the same thing when you're tethering from your phone, that's secure. When I join a Starbucks, uh, I have no idea how many people are connected to that network. I can reasonably assume that all the people I see in the Starbucks that have laptops open are on that network, but there also could be lots of people I can't see who are in apartment buildings or offices that are close enough to access that wireless network, and I have no idea who's on that network. And that's, that's the fundamental difference between using your personal wireless device versus using a public Wi-Fi. I hope that answers that question. Okay. Onwards, oh, we're bumping up against time pressure. All right, so uh, next poll, does your organization use a mobile device management platform? Again, I'm expecting not to be a lot of folks. Uh, oh, first answer in, someone is using a mobile device management platform. And if you uh, happen to know which mobile device management platform your organization is using, I would love it if you would type that into the chat. I'm very curious as to know which ones people are using out there. And uh, we've got one saying the MDM and G Suite, which makes a ton of sense since that's free. And there's another one, MDM and G Suite. So that makes a lot of sense. Those of you who are using uh, G Suite for nonprofits that does have a mobile device management function built in. Same thing with Office 365, although they're more robust one, which is called Intune. It's something you have to pay for separately. Ben, let's go ahead and close that up. And this is why I love these polls. I'm, I'm surprised that as many people as, as uh, 
you know, are using MDM, that's great. That makes me very happy. Uh, still, vast majority either don't know or are not using MDM. Let's go ahead and close that up then. And let's talk a little bit about what, oh, this is a little break, a little, a little comic break. So this is a word that actually a friend of mine made up. And I just wanted to share with everybody this sort of like addition to vocabulary. While we're talking about mobile security, of course, the thing that everybody worries about the most is dropping your phone and having your screen cracked and then being one of those uh, sad people that we all see who, you know, has the cracked phone that they're still using and hasn't gotten the screen fixed. I always just, my heart breaks a little bit every time I see someone who's working on the cracked phone. And we all, of course, drop our phone, you know, a few times a month or, or more frequently for some of us. And uh, there's that moment after you drop the phone where you're not sure if the screen is cracked or not. And so the, my friend came up with this, with this word. She's a linguist, and she came up with this word, Vergenkrack. Vergenkrack, which is that feeling of apprehension. It's that, and it describes that moment uh, between when you drop the phone and it's laying face down on the sidewalk and you, and you don't know if it's cracked or not, and then you, that, that apprehension where you pick it up and find out whether it's broken or not. So I just want to share that word as a little comic interlude before we get into the nitty gritty of mobile device management. That's a word you could all go ahead. I'm sure everybody will be saying Vergenkrack a uh, lot now, but in my family we actually say it. I like had a big Vergenkrack today. All right. Mobile device management. What does mobile device management do? Well, it secures, monitors, and manages mobile devices. That certainly makes a lot of sense. But if we get into the nitty gritties, apologies for the billions of words on this slide. This is just a screenshot of Microsoft's Intune and just one section of the settings that they allow you to apply to iOS devices or iPhones. And this is an example of the kinds of things if you're using an MDM. So how does this work? If I'm an Office 365 customer, if my organization is using Office 365 and I pay for Intune, then when people add our Office 365 to their phone, I now get the ability to do all of these things. I can require them to have a password so that you know, 9% of you that don't have a password on your mobile device, you'll now be required to have one. I can even require a type of password, numeric only or alphanumeric. I can require the complexity, length. Uh, I can decide when it expires. I can allow fingerprint unlock or I can disable fingerprint unlock. I can set the minutes of activity before the screen turns off, before it asks for a lock. Those are some of the basic things that I can now deploy as a policy to anyone who wants to access our information from their personal mobile device. More advanced, and again, this is maybe one-tenth of all the settings that are available through Intune for iOS devices. I can restrict the apps. I can do this either I can list, I can blacklist certain apps and say these apps are not allowed, so I can say you're not allowed to install Signal, no encrypted messaging if I decide that's something I want to do. Or I can do it the other way around, which is a lot easier from an administrative perspective, which is to only allow listed apps. So people actually have to submit an app from the App Store to be whitelisted, I'll whitelist it, and then you can allow it uh, to be installed in your device. I can even control Siri and decide whether or not they're allowed to use Siri. And this is, at its most basic level, this is the idea of what mobile device management is doing. It's giving you some level of control over people's devices if they're going to access your organization's email, documents, applications from those mobile devices. They then, before they can put you know, their Office 365 email on their iPhone or Android, they have to agree to this mobile device management and then that gets enforced on their devices. It also will almost always give me the ability to remote wipe the device if the device is stolen, uh, to lock the device remotely, to change the password for the device if I need to. So there's a lot of implications here again around privacy. <clears throat> but uh, from a security perspective, it's obviously very, very, very helpful. The most common mobile device managers, Microsoft Intune, which, which pairs with Office 365, G Suite Mobile Management, which is free with G Suite for nonprofits, and VMware AirWatch is the most popular and, and highly regarded uh, paid version. And I believe that they, these run about 3 to $5 per user and each user gets up to three devices that can be managed as part of that. So this is not massively expensive stuff, and a lot of them will also include things like malware detection and uh, heuristics to let you know if the device is sort of doing things that indicate that it's been compromised, 
and other alerts like that. Uh, and just as a just as a FYI, I'm obviously not going to out who the person is, but uh, we have this enabled for Roundtable, and we get alerts and. Someone at Roundtable uh, who was experimenting uh, with one of their phones, they actually have two phones enrolled in our service, they rooted their Android phone, meaning they changed, and this, by the way, is not something I recommend, especially if you want to keep your phone secure, uh, but they essentially replaced the factory operating system on it with a, a different build. And so it, I got a bunch of alerts saying this phone is doing some pretty strange things, I'm going to look into that. And that's another example of something MDM can do. All right, we've hit our 2.30. I apologize that I'm going to go a little bit over, but this has, I've been getting this question a lot over the last couple of months, and I wanted to talk about it. So advice on crossing international borders. And the question that I specifically have been getting probably a couple of times a week for the last couple of months is someone says, I am going out of the country and I'm nervous about when I come back in, what should I do? Should I wipe all my devices? Should I not bring my devices? Should I, someone told me I should run them out of batteries so that when I come across there's no battery on it. Um, someone else told me I should bring a burner phone. And, uh, and I, I've been very reluctant to sort of give clear advice other than, uh, you know, it's a kind of a personal choice about what you want to do, but, uh, you know, as long as you're not doing anything illegal and don't have major concerns about privacy, I would say just go, come back across the border. If they ask you, you know, to take a look at your phone and decide whether you want to sit in detention for a long time or whether you just want to let them look at your phone and be on your way. Uh, basically, the, it, it's complicated. And I would really, I, in the links, I have a link to an article that says, if, please, everybody stop giving uh, bad or made up advice around this sort of thing. And I, I'm going to adhere to that as well and just give some links. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, who I highly respect, uh, they have a very new primer that they have made on exactly this issue and how to sort of protect yourselves and the implications of doing different kinds of things. And there's another great article there that walks into what legally uh, the Border Patrol can and cannot do. And if anyone has concerns around this, uh, I certainly want you know to give you as m much good information as I can, and I'm more than happy to talk to you and help you walk through the various issues. But I would suggest those two things, both of which are in the resources, as the places I would start. They are the smartest most reasonable things I have seen on the on this topic. And with that, we get into our wrap-up. Oh my gosh, lots of questions here. Okay. Key success factors, as always. Use two-factor authentication wherever possible. It's nothing new. You're going to hear me say that about a billion times. Encrypt your devices. Keep your devices up to date. Password protect your devices. Enable location services if you want to be able to track your losses. Again, privacy versus security. From a security standpoint, I'd love to have location services enabled, so if someone grabs my device or if I lose it, I can know where it is. From a privacy perspective, I may not want to have location services enabled all the time. This is a trade-off. So I've talked before about how there's trade-offs between convenience and security. Well, now there's trade-offs between privacy and security, which is really fascinating. Uh, there's a, a really interesting thing I found in my research called Prey Project, P-R-E-Y Project, that is an open source project that allows, it's pretty cool, I wasn't able to get a lot of independently verified sort of reviews of the, the service, although generally it seems to be well regarded, but not only does it let you track your phone after it's taken, but it lets you do stuff like start taking photos, start recording, start uh, using the phone, obviously, as a forensic tool to immediately begin capturing information about uh, wherever the phone was left. Uh, so you've turned your phone into a nifty little remote spy device, so you can just leave it at a friend's house and then act like it was stolen from Prey Project and start recording everything that's going on there, which is kind of horrifying, but also cool if it was stolen. So people are welcome to take a look at that. Uh, when you can, use your data plan for your mobile device over public Wi-Fi, or if you need to use public Wi-Fi, use VPN. Don't just use public Wi-Fi uh, without a VPN, and consider mobile device management solutions, especially if, if you're a larger organization. Last poll, what are your biggest challenges around mobile devices, remote, and travel? So then if we can throw that up. We got bring your own device policies, bring your own device management. This is one where you can select as many of these as you like. 
loss, theft, and or damage, being secure while traveling, while working remotely, crossing borders. What are people worried about? So a lot of loss, theft, or damage. People are going in. We'll, we'll let people continue to vote for a little bit, and then we'll open up for q and I'm looking at the, the questions, and there's a lot of them in here, unless a lot of them are comments. So we might be here for a little bit. I'm, I'm fine until about 10 minutes to 3, so I'll hang out. Ben, you can go ahead and close that up. Being secure while traveling seems to be the biggest, followed by loss, theft, and or damage. So that prey project uh, might be something folks definitely want to look at. And I would say, again, having passwords on your phone, on your mobile devices, and having them be encrypted, uh, which on smartphones is essentially the same thing, huge thing to do about protecting that information when it's uh, being lost. All right. Oops. Here are the resources that I talked about. So that EFF, digital privacy at the US border, protecting data on your devices and in the cloud. What customs and border officials can and can't do, that article. And then the, the article that I read, that I, that, that I, if those of you take a look at that, you'll see I basically took that little meme of we could stop making up advice, that'd be great. I just borrowed it straight from that article. I like that article a lot. I'm still waiting for the follow-up where he said he was going to give actual advice. Uh, the mobile device managers, and then, of course, uh, theft protection. Two weeks, we'll be doing Don't Feed the Fish, April 4th, 2 p.m. I look forward to seeing folks there. We'll also be talking about ransomware in that and social engineering, which is one of my favorite topics. And with that, Q&A. Ben, thank you so much for your uh, help today. And everybody, thanks for your great sure. question. And right. I actually, as Josh mentioned earlier, I've done the border crossing in the last week. So um, I may have a unique perspective if there are questions about that um, specifically. So. Uh, if you have a question about that, I'm happy to answer. Uh, but basically, my general experience is uh, it has way more to do with the time of day, the uh, apathy of the border crossing uh, official, and then obviously what country you're actually a citizen of. Um, the best advice I got the day before I left was if you're a United States citizen and you're not going overseas to do anything illegal, then you have nothing to worry about. So just be aware. Don't try not to act suspicious because if you haven't done anything wrong, you really have nothing to worry about. If you do get selected for extra screening, listen to their uh, commands, comply with any of their requests. And if they do ask to see your phone, that's fine. Just use the password manager that we talked about a few sections ago and maybe update your passwords or change them if you're concerned about access. So it's a, it's all pretty common sense stuff, but um uh, the other thing that I tried to do as well is in the week leading up to my travel, I actually did a little bit of research and actually read that article that Josh gave links to. So just making sure that you're informed and aware and, um, you know, not doing anything illegal. And obviously, if you are going overseas to do something illegal, then uh, you've already made that decision. <laughs> so <laughs> we're, not here to, we're not here to help you with that. Yeah. Right, 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 so. right. And obviously, you know, since we have a lot of folks who are um, nonprofits and maybe doing things uh, to, you know, advocacy and lobbying and things that may be contrary to government agencies or policies, then just be aware of that and, you know, contact your counsel or your, you know, in-house lawyers to figure out your best path forward. But Again, like I said, if you're just traveling for vacation or you know just general international travel, if you're a United States citizen and you're not doing anything legal, you generally don't have anything to worry about. So that's my unique perspective. There we go. Totally uncontroversial perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're watching a lot of West Wing. It's a lot about pandering and you know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'm to get to some quick questions. I accidentally deleted a question, and uh, I actually don't know how to restore a deleted question, in, uh, and, I, and I didn't see what it was. So I apologize if, uh, if someone doesn't get their question answered before we wrap up. I'll hang out just for an extra minute. Uh, one question was uh, if you have a, or this is a comment um, from someone about, you know, border stuff being uh, complicated. If you have a relationship with a cybersecurity vendor, you can certainly talk with them. Advice can be country specific, and that's absolutely true. Depending on where you're going and the nature of the work you're doing, advice may vary around uh, different things you're doing. Other places you can look, Electronic Frontier Foundation is great about this. Uh, another place to look, if you're doing international travel and doing human rights work or things where you're your security profile is, you know, a particular threat model. Uh, accessnow.org is another really great uh, organization and source of information on, on things of this nature. All right. Other questions. 
does NordVPN or other private VPN services require a firewall vendor such as Fortinet, Cisco, et cetera? No, and it does, it's typically an either or. So if you if your organization is using a SonicWall or a Fortinet or a Cisco firewall, then those firewalls come with VPN clients that will allow you from your remote device, your phone, your computer, connect to your organization's firewall and then be browsing through your organization's internet connection behind that firewall. And it's, it's again, imagine it if I, if I'm sitting in my office behind my office's firewall, right? I'm protected by that firewall, assuming that firewall is correctly configured. If I'm at home, I'm and my home network. If I'm at home and I boot up a VPN that connects to my office network, I've now, in a virtual sense, picked up my computer and put it inside my organization's office. It's inside that firewall in a virtual sense. That's literally where virtual networking comes from. If you if your organization doesn't provide that to you, then those private VPN services are what you're paying for. Uh, another question is, would you need to use a virtual private network in addition to mobile device management? Some mobile device managers include a VPN as part of their services. Uh, some of them don't. It depends on the, the service. So you would have to know whether or not the mobile device management service you're using uh, includes a VPN as part of it. If it does, then certainly use that VPN instead of paying for a separate one. If it doesn't, then you would still need a VPN. They're, they're kind of separate uh, things in that regard. All right, and let's see. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. If anyone feels like their questions, um, then we cover it. Destiny has a question here about the new laptop tablet fan. Destiny, do you, I don't know if I can unmute you, um, to share that question because I'm confused about it and I'm not familiar with the, the news article to which you are referring. Ben, are you, did that question make sense to you what Destiny is asking? The only thing I could think is it's related to the, the current travel ban, but as far as I'm aware, that's on hold, that's enjoined, so that's not actually yeah. applicable, but I, I'm not sure. Destiny, I think I've unmuted you. Can you clarify that question if you're still still around? Uh, yeah, it, it may not have been implemented yet, but it was concerning a specific ban, not from um, countries the way the travel ban was, but on from certain countries of origin allowing the uh, bringing tablets, laptops, and other things directly on the plane that they can only be in checked luggage. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's any concerns, if the, and that's not necessarily based on your nationality or citizenship, but really from your airport or country of yeah. origin. So it could apply, from my understanding, to U.S. citizens, um, and that, of course, putting any of your mobile devices or other devices in checked luggage is always a concern even without um, other things in play. So it's, yeah. I think, okay. something to be in mind when uh, traveling now. So you're saying but, there's, there's, there's new legislation that's basically saying if I was, let's say, flying in from Syria, that maybe my iPad, I'm not allowed to have it with me on the plane. I actually am required to put it in my check bag if I'm flying to the United States from Syria. And so your huh? question then is, it, what, if I'm putting it in my check bag and I'm worried about, um, you know, customs agents or ever looking at it not in my presence, what, um, I mean, if that's the, the law, then that's something you'll clearly have to do. Um, what's yeah. the, is, what's the question underlying that? I think the, the concern around that is if we if there's now um, the addition of uh, devices being accessed without your presence, so you're not sure what's being done, if there's any kind gotcha. of, okay. you know. It, 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 that, that's, in, a, in many ways, I totally understand the question now, and the upshot of that is that that's easier. Um, if I have my password encrypted, if I have my device encrypted with a strong password, then they can have it for as long as they want. Um, in theory, it sh they shouldn't really be able to get. It, it would be much faster for them to just throw me in a detaining in a detention center and say, "Give us your password, and then we'll let you go home." And that's that's what's generally been happening. If they want access to the devices, I, I have not heard of anything that's suggesting that um, border agents or folks have the ability to, with ac physical access to the device, that was turned off and encrypted and protected with a strong password. Uh, there's nothing that I've heard that suggests that they're able to, with physical access to the device, get information off of it. Yeah. Um, but that is a great question. 
but yeah, yeah. The, but all those other if, if your if your device is of course no password, then uh, yeah, that's a huge concern. But hopefully you're not traveling internationally with a mobile device with no password. Yeah. If you've been attending these workshops. I <laughs> right, right. And obviously, uh, anybody I'll who's cry. doing that international <laughs> travel, to uh, just keep an eye on the State Department website because if things do change, if there's an updated law or regulation or something like that, uh, they're gonna they're gonna post that in big block letters on the top of the page because. Um, they don't want to deal with massive numbers of people not knowing about that law any more than you want to deal with not knowing about that law and having to deal with it. So, um, like I like I was saying before, just use the few days and lead up to your travel if you have them. And, you know, if you have that much advance notice, to just just educate yourself a little bit more about what uh, what you could see and what uh, what changes may occur. But um, in most cases, you know, just keeping an eye on the State Department website or um, you know, EFF, like Josh mentioned before, will have updates and, and um, guidance on that stuff leading up to travel. So, Or ask us. By all means, email me. Yeah, or ask us. Yeah, exactly. I, know I, yeah. I know I attend these webinars. By all means, email me directly and ask me questions. You, you are my friend. Right. Uh, I, I, that covers all the questions we have. Again, I deleted someone's question. I don't even remember who it, whose it was. I apologize. If you're still here and your question has not been answered, you have. I will give you another 30 seconds to retype it into the <laughs> question, and I'll, I'll be keeping a close eye on that. Otherwise, we are done. Thank you all. I'll see everybody back here in two weeks for Don't Feed the Fish, Fishing, Social Engineering, and ransomware, which is, uh, I know, a very hot topic. And thank you all so much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Destiny. And uh, thank, you. thank you all for your great questions. Bye-bye, everybody. Great. Thanks, guys.